Good morning. Uh, I, want to thank, I want to thank Art Alfaro and uh, President Smith for the invitation to be here. It's an honor to be here. And uh, so I don't forget, I want to be sure to point out at the beginning, all of you who are involved in public service, I appreciate your service, whether you're a firefighter, police officer, civilian employee, trustee, whatever you do, uh, it matters, and I appreciate your service. Um, I should have time at the end for questions. Uh, it's a quick overview of what I'm going to talk about here. Public pensions in the United States and in Texas. Funding conditions in both U.S. and Texas. We'll talk in specifics about uh, investment return assumptions that are used uh, and also the contribution experience, especially the contribution experience of public pension plans in the state. And I'm going to address that uh, interim charge that uh, Art referred to a moment ago and apparently Mr. Uh, Representative Anchia referred to yesterday. I'd like to start out with a big picture perspective of retirement benefits in the United States. 50,000 foot view of where we are with regard to retirement benefits in the United States. And when you do the math and you count on the, on the private side, private sector in the U.S., if you do the math, full-time employees, part-time employees, only about one half of the private sector workforce is participating in an employer-sponsored retirement plan, which of course means the other half is not. Um, and that's a problem in itself that uh, we won't talk about this morning, but it is, a, it is a problem and a challenge. As you probably know, defined benefit plans, pension plans have slowly been going away in the private sector. Um, a generation ago in the early mid-70s, uh, close to half of the private sector workforce was participating in an employer-sponsored pension that has uh, declined steadily and continuously, continues to decline. Now fewer than one in five private sector employees uh, participates in a pension plan, uh, something that uh, we tend to take for granted in the, uh, in the public sector among states and local governments. And, of course, Social Security is substantially universal in the private sector. Just about everybody in the private sector is participating in Social Security. On the other side, public employees, when I refer to public employees here, this is employees of state and local government, not federal employees. Federal employees with regard to retirement benefits are a horse of a different color. So state and local government employees, again, if you do the math, three-fourths of all public employees are participating in a defined benefit plan or a pension plan. Uh, substantially all of the remainder are participating in a defined contribution plan. Uh, some of that 25 percent who's participating in a defined contribution plan is doing so because they have a choice. They've chosen to get into the uh, defined contribution plan. Most, that's the only plan that's available. And as you probably know, Social Security is not universal in the public sector. About one-fourth of employees of state and local government do not participate in Social Security. That includes 40 percent of public school teachers do not participate in Social Security. According to TRS of Texas, 80 percent roughly of their school districts do not participate in Social Security. Uh, it's possible that some of those school districts are larger or smaller, so I don't know that it's fair to say that 20 percent of public school teachers in Texas are participating in Social Security, but most public school teachers in Texas do not participate in uh, Social Security. Also nationwide, a majority of firefighters and police officers do not participate in Social Security as well for what it's worth. Uh, most to uh, nearly all employees in a number of states, including a couple near Texas, Colorado, and, and uh, Louisiana, uh, do not participate in Social Security. So pretty much everybody in those states, among others, is outside of uh, Social Security. Uh, big picture view of public pensions. Uh, again, this is just uh, state and local government pensions in the United States. Uh, last count, this is the Federal Reserve counts this for us approaching six trillion dollars uh, in uh, market value of assets. This is an all-time record, as you might expect. About 10 percent of the nation's workforce is participating in one of these uh, state and local pension plans, more than 14 million employees, a figure that's roughly held steady uh, for the last uh, 10 or 12 years, actually gone down uh, a bit recently. <clears throat> uh, and the number of retirees or annuitants who are receiving a regular benefit from these plans continues to grow steadily, typically 5%, 5 or 6 percent each year. Uh, and so the ratio between the number of people who are contributing acting, active to these uh, pension plans compared to those who are receiving a regular benefit continues to decline, uh, slowly but surely heading toward having as many people receiving a regular benefit from these public pension plans uh, as uh, who are working and active and, and contributing. You can see the money in, $238 billion. Uh, lion's share of which is coming from employers, relatively smaller portion from employees. And US, the U.S. Census Bureau counts the number of uh, retirement systems in the United States, more than 5,000. 
uh, which is kind of an odd figure, really. Uh, there are 100 in the state of Texas. There are more than 3,000 in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Uh, and predictably, the vast majority of those are relatively small public pension plans. Uh, a few other states, Florida, Michigan, um, Illinois, have uh, several hundred public pension plans. But <clears throat> if you focus just on the largest of those, uh, largest 100 or 200, um, and here we, we note the largest 75 account for more than 8% of all the money in the people. So it's kind of an interesting construct, sort of like a barbell. On one side of the barbell, you've got a very large number of systems that account for a small portion of the money in the people. On the other side of the barbell, excuse me, you've got a large, um, very large portion of the money in the people, but a very small number of plants. It's an interesting, uh, interesting arrangement. So I want to talk about the funding level, the aggregate public pension funding level. And this is based on the public fund survey, which is a data set that we maintain. Uh, about 120 public pension plans, every state in the United States uh, is represented uh, in this. And this accounts for uh, the plans that are in this data set account for about 85% of all of the uh, public pension money and people in the United States. And I started measuring this, uh, this data back in 2001, which just happened to be, didn't know it at the time, but it happened to be the all-time high aggregate funding level on, on a weighted basis for public pension plans. If you were to go back before this time frame, you would find fairly slow, steady improvement in aggregate public pension funding levels uh, that was accentuated with a fairly sharp peak there during the late 1990s. You might remember what was happening in the late 1990s. We had several years in a row of double-digit investment returns uh, for public, pe public pension fans, plans, and they peaked out there in fiscal year 2001. And so uh, it has been my pleasure to be uh, plotting this information for, uh, for the first 13 years of which there was a continuous decline in public pension funding levels. Uh, and it's, it's, it's interesting what happened here. You can see the recessions are noted here, and the recessions were also accompanied by market declines. Uh, and you all may remember the market decline of 2000 to 2002. There were three consecutive years of lower equity markets in the United States. Uh, public pension plans typically uh, phase in their investment gains and losses over five years. And so you can see a fa fairly predictable pattern, five years of declining um, funding level in the aggregate for these plans that uh, uh, leveled off there for a couple of years and then the Great Recession came along, great financial crisis came along, uh, significant declines in uh, public pension assets, capital markets declined uh, globally, and you can see about five or six years of uh, predictably uh, consecutive decline in public pension funding levels as public pension plan plans uh, phased in those uh, losses over a uh, several year period. Important to remember as well in 2008 2009 was a very severe recession and in terms of uh, the effect of, on public pension plans, states and local governments uh, experienced a significant uh, reduction in their revenues and their ability to make contributions was impaired. Uh, and that set off a uh, really an unprecedented period of public pension reform beginning uh, uh, following the Great Recession and the Great Financial Crisis. Uh, unprecedented in a couple of ways. One is in the number of states and plans that were reformed. And when I say reform in this context, that means lower benefits. And that means higher employee contributions. So reform is a bit of a euphemism. It was lower benefits, higher employee contributions uh, that went on for a long period. Uh, it was also unprecedented in the magnitude of the changes. In many states and many cities, the uh, extent of the change was significant, um, as you probably know. Uh, and so what, one thing that another element of this chart that's interesting me, to me is this extended period of sort of a flat line to level aggregate public pension funding level. Uh, but there was actually a lot going on during that period, uh, notwithstanding this uh, flat funding level. Um, in addition to those pension reforms that were intended to reduce the overall cost of the plan, reduce the overall risk of the plan, um, public pension plans also were reducing their investment return assumption. And as you know, all else equal, a lower return assumption reduces the uh, funding level of the plan. Uh, and if you were to plot out, which I've done, the change in funding level during this period where you see this flat line, you actually see substantial variation. And many plans actually improved their funding level during this time, and many plans' funding level dropped during this time frame. So this is an average. 
but uh, the, it really obscures uh, the reality that there was a, a, actually a significant amount of uh, change in public pension funding levels both up and down during this time frame. And then finally, the um, observation I want to make about this chart, as you can see there at the very end, fiscal year 21, we don't have complete data for fiscal 21, but we have enough to know that uh, based on the very strong investment returns that the market has produced since March 2020, following the onset of the pandemic, that uh, public pension funding levels uh, should improve by about 3 or 4 percent in the aggregate for fiscal year 21, and assuming no uh, significant drop or uh, volatility in uh, global, uh, especially equity markets, global markets in general, um, that funding level should continue to improve, I would say, by about 3 percent each year for the next few years. And we'll look at that uh, in a little bit more detail here. So this is a bubble chart. This chart is plotting the uh, actuarial funding level of that same set of plans, about 120 public pension plans. The plans in here reflect about 80, 85 percent of all the money and the people in the public pension plans in the United States. Bigger bubbles reflect bigger plans, smaller bubbles, smaller plans. Every state is represented. Some states are represented by more than one plan. As you might expect, uh, the big plan there in the middle is CalPERS, the nation's largest public pension plan. The uh, larger bubble to the lower left of CalPERS is CalSTRS, California State Teachers Retirement System. Um, <clears throat> and to orient you on a few others, Teacher Retirement System of Texas is up there in the low 80s. That's that big bubble just north of 80. Other large, well-funded public pension plans, Wisconsin Retirement System, the two uh, New York state plans, Florida Retirement System, all pretty well-funded public pension plans. You can see this runs quite a range. You know, you add up all the actuarial experience, all the actuarial methods and assumptions and so forth, and this is where it all lays out, and it's uh, really quite a range. It goes from below 20 percent, that's the Kentucky State Retirement System, to uh, north of 110 percent and uh, many places in between. Um, I think that the experience of the Kentucky Retirement System is worth mentioning. It's very interesting. Um, the Kentucky Retirement System in fiscal year 2000 was funded at 120 percent. And so they went from 120% to below 20% funded over the space of about 20 years. And that's a whole story unto itself, but it is a cautionary tale. Uh, another observation or two that I want to make about this, California State Teacher Retirement System, as I mentioned there, the larger bubble to the lower left of the CalPERS bubble, uh, for a number of years, about, uh, about a decade, was receiving significantly less than the required contribution. They were a fixed rate public pension plan. And when the actually determined cost of that plan rose above the fixed rate, the California legislature was very slow to react. So for years, they were getting significantly less than the required contribution. And you could just watch their funding level slide down on this chart from the, toward the lower left. And they had corrected that a number of years ago and had begun to uh, move back up, back up to, the, uh, to the right. That large bubble that's there at about 40% uh, is the Illinois Teacher Retirement System. Uh, and they have uh, experienced the same phenomenon, consistently uh, receiving significantly less than the uh, required contribution, and they've got a pretty big hole there in Illinois. Uh, that's just the biggest plan in Illinois, the Illinois State Employees Retirement System, um, the Illinois State University's retirement system, number of plans in Chicago, all in uh, really perilous actuarial condition, primarily because they have consistently failed to pay or receive. It's not the pension plans that pay, it's the pension plans that receive. The cities and state pay, and in, and in Illinois, they consistently have failed to pay the required contribution. But it's interesting to see where it all lays out. This is based on fiscal year 20. As we talked about a moment ago in fiscal year 21, all of this should rise a little bit by about 3 or 4 percent, uh, which is obviously a positive development. So I want to uh, focus on Texas for a moment. Big picture of Texas, as Pension Review Board tells us, Last count, $350 billion in assets, all told. More than a million, close to a million and a half active working participants, 800,000 retirees receiving regularly $19 billion. That means these plans are paying out more than a billion and a half every month that go pretty much literally into every city and town in the state of Texas. Contributions. One thing to note about the contributions, you'll remember that national figure was showing that employer contributions were three, a little over three times as much as employee contributions. And in the state of Texas, it's just about maybe one and a half to one, which, which is to say that employees are contributing, uh, relative to the nation as a whole, employees in Texas are contributing a larger share of the total contributions to uh, pension plans uh, compared to the nation as a whole. 
similar construct of the, of the retirement systems in Texas uh, compared to the nation as a whole. Uh, four statewide systems count for more than 90% of the money in the people, and the TRS alone accounts for more than one half of all of the money in the people in terms of public pension plans. Aggregate funding level, last count is about 78%. So this is the distribution of public pension plans in uh, Texas. I did not provide the uh, relative bubble size, chiefly because the four big statewide plans, and especially TRS, sort of outsize everything else, and it's difficult to convey on a chart. So what I really wanted to show on this chart was the breakout of uh, public pension funding levels based on the peer group. There's four basic peer groups of uh, plans in Texas. Telfer plans, Muni plans, 810 plans, and statewide plans. And the 810 plans, if you're not familiar with those, those are like special districts, like airport authorities, hospital authorities, um, mass transit authorities, public uh, transit authorities, that sort of thing. And those 810 plans really operate uh, more closely to uh, what the way corporate pension plans operate as opposed to a typical public pension plan. And we'll see that in more detail uh, in a moment. But their governing board tends to be made up of officers from the agency, such as the chief financial officer, a human resources officer, a CEO, uh, rather than having a separate board that oversees the plan per se. Um, and then, of course, I assume that you all are familiar with Telfer plans, the uh, local firefighter plans, the statewides, and the municipal plans. And so I've put on here the median uh, funding level based on the latest available data. I think it's all or substantially all fiscal year 20 information. Median public pension funding level for these, these 810 plans, about 85, 86 percent funded. Statewides, 83. Uh, muni plans, 76. And the Telfer plans are at about 60 one percent. And this is where they all lay out, interestingly, a, a similar sort of uh, shape or pattern uh, as the uh, United States as a whole, which we saw a moment ago. Uh, just, I didn't want to miss the opportunity to just point out some notable statutory changes. You may be aware of these that the legislature has approved uh, just in the last few years. The legislature has been very active uh, in recent years with regard to uh, public pension plans, especially with regard to reporting, required disclosures. These go to the Pension Review Board. And now public pension plans are required to submit uh, investment policy statements, uh, investment performance reports, asset liability studies, and a funding policy. The funding policy is interesting. It took two steps, as you might be aware. First, a few years ago, they passed a requirement that every plan in the state uh, produce a funding policy. And uh, then upon recognizing or acknowledging that uh, really a funding policy um, didn't mean a whole lot if the plan sponsor was not involved because the plan sponsor is the, uh, the driver uh, in terms of funding the, the uh, funding policy or being responsible for it. Uh, and so the legislature amended that legislation and required that the plan sponsor be involved in uh, the development of the uh, funding policy. Frankly, when I got on the Pension Review Board about eight years ago, I was surprised to learn that almost no public pension plans in the state uh, had a funding policy. I was uh, amazed at that. And I think there's been a real positive development in recent years to see public pension plans develop a funding policy. Excuse me. Sorry. I'm going to talk about uh, investment return assumptions. And I think it's useful to start out with a discussion of investment return assumptions with, with this pie chart, which is capturing all of the money, all of the revenue that has come into public pension funds for all public pension funds in the United States over the last 30 years. This is how it breaks out. And this is 60% six, from investment earnings. 28% from uh, employer contributions, 12% from employee contributions. But that 60% is a fairly stable figure. We've been uh, tracking this figure for a long time, and it's always been between somewhere between 60 and 65%. Next year will probably be a little bit bigger because of the strong investment gains that we've seen in the last uh, uh, couple of years. Um, but to me, one of the things this uh, chart really illustrates clearly is the uh, outsized role that uh, investments play with regard to funding a pension plan. Um, we expect investment earnings will pay for a majority of the cost of uh, pension benefits. Uh, and it also really highlights the uh, importance uh, of the investment return assumption uh, in funding a pension plan and properly funding a pension plan. So this is uh, a, di a chart plotting the distribution of uh, the nominal investment return assumption that's used by 131 public pension plans. Again, these are plans that cover the the uh, 
The vast majority of assets and participants in the United States, these 131 plans count for about 85 percent of the money and the people in the United States, all states are covered, and so forth. And if you look at the beginning of the measurement period there in fiscal year 01 on the left-hand side of the chart, you can see that uh, more than three-fourths of the plans had a, an investment return assumption of 8 percent or higher. There are some plans that were north of 8.5%. Uh, New Jersey at that time had a return assumption of 8 and 3 quarters percent. That was a different time and age, wasn't it? And you can see that uh, there was a sort of a slow, gradual decline in uh, return assumptions uh, during the uh, first part of this, uh, this new century that really uh, accelerated following the great financial crisis and the recession. You'll recall that inflation uh, dropped, interest rates dropped, um, projected returns on asset classes, especially equities, dropped at that time, interest rates, and so on. And you can see that there was this sort of rush that began following the Great Recession to lower return assumptions. Uh, and that has, uh, that has continued literally to this, to this day. We, we continue to uh, receive reports of uh, public pension plans that are lowering their return assumption. Uh, we had sort of a benchmark last week when we learned that the Ohio Police and Fire Plan became the last plan in our data set that was at 8% that uh, reduced their return assumption. They went down to 7.5%. Uh, so no longer is 8% the return the, uh, a return assumption that's even represented in this data set for many years, going back really to the late 80s, early 90s, 8% was the uh, primary return assumption. As you can see on here, about half of the, re of the plans had a return assumption of 8%. Um, and that was a place where uh, public pension plans found a lot of comfort because most other public pension plans were at or around that same level. And obviously that has, that has really changed. Same information, just presented a different way. This is the average and median return assumption of the same 131 plans. You can really see the, the funding levels, I mean the return assumption sort of dropped off the, the table following the great financial crisis, the recession in 08 and 09. Uh, essentially, we've gone from 8% to 7% over the last decade. And it looks like a dramatic drop, and it is a dramatic drop. It's not as dramatic as the decline in uh, interest rates that have occurred during the same period. It's not as dramatic as the decline in uh, inflation that has occurred during the same period, but it is a significant decline. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, uh, this represents a significant headwind to funding a public pension plan because uh, uh, public pension plans expect investment earnings to pay for a significant portion of the, uh, of the benefit, and when you're expecting 7% rather than 8%, that's a lot of money that has to come from somewhere else, uh, either out of reduced benefits or higher contributions from employees and or employers. So it's difficult to understate the, uh, the effect and the magnitude of a, change, of a change like this. And then finally, same data, but this is where we are right now, the latest information. Uh, this is where the uh, 131 plans lay out. You can see that uh, the vast majority of them are in the 6.5 to 7.5 percent range. 7 um, percent is now the prevailing assumption as opposed to 8 percent from uh, a decade ago. So I want to drill down on the uh, investment return assumption that's used by public pension plans in the state of Texas. We've got 98 of the 100 plans here. We don't have the other two plans. Uh, and again, this is broken out by peer group. So we've got 810 plans, um, Muni plans, statewides, and Telfra, and you can see the, the way it uh, is distributed. You can also see the average return assumption that is used. This is the latest available data, uh, and I think it's uh, completely accurate or substantially, substantially up to date. And you can see these 810 plans that, I, again, operate sort of as corporate type public pension plans. They have got the lowest uh, as a group. Uh, nominal return assumption, 6.6 percent. Muni plans and statewides are fairly consistent with the national average, just above 7 percent. And then Telfer plans, a uh, bit of an outlier there at about 7.4 percent. And so what I wanted to do was uh, compare the, uh, the, these return assumptions on an average basis with the uh, investment experience that these uh, plans by peer group have had. Um, and I want to emphasize something before I say this, and that is investing in pension assets is not a competition. You're not doing it to beat the median. You're not doing it to uh, shoot the lights out. You're not supposed to be swinging for the fences. You're supposed to be offsetting the cost of the plan within an acceptable level of risk. And some plans take more risk than others. others. Some plans do better under uh, periods of strong equity markets. Some plans do better in bear markets or when uh, bonds are doing, performing well, et cetera. 
Every plan has got its own unique risk profile and its own preferences, its own asset allocation, and so on. So I don't want anybody to infer that I'm suggesting that anybody is underperforming here or that your investment returns should be higher because that's a different conversation. All I'm doing is comparing the investment return assumption for each group with the actual investment returns. And uh, moving from the left, we can see the statewide plans, uh, as we saw a moment ago, their average return assumption, 7.2, and for the period that ended, and, and also I would, I would provide the caveat that not all periods ended are, are identical because plans have different reporting periods and fiscal year end dates, but I think that all or substantially all of these are for periods ended in 2020. So it's very similar. And over a 10-year period, those uh, minor differences um, become even, even uh, more comparable. So you can see the uh, statewide experience, uh, 7.2 versus 8.38 percent, which stands to reason, if you think about it, uh, that is their relative experience because, uh, to, uh, relative to the other plans, because larger plans have got more resources. Um, they can afford better consultants, frankly. They get more access to private equity markets, other opportunities that may not be available to all investors, and we would expect, and we typically observe, uh, one study after another has affirmed this, that uh, larger plans have better opportunities uh, to uh, capital markets and to certain elements of the capital markets, and they are, as a group, they tend to uh, outperform smaller uh, pension funds. So it's not a surprise that the statewide funds during this time frame have had the uh, highest investment experience. Uh, the 810 plans, you can see uh, the difference there between their uh, average assumption and their actual, their actual return. Muni plans likewise, and then the Telfer plans. And the Telfer plans are the only group here whose uh, um, actual returns over the time frame have fallen short of their return assumption on average. And so same information, but uh, sort of drilled down. Uh, and this is uh, um, plotting the experience of each of these plans. And hopefully, you're not colorblind, because this is, uh, it's very important to be able to distinguish these distinguish these colors. So the Telfer plans are there in the green, the Muni's in the sky blue, statewide's red, 810, plan, 810 plans in the more uh, royal blue. And so this is the difference uh, between the assumed and the actual um, assumption, between the assumption and the actual return for that 10-year time frame. And it runs a, a wide range, it's very interesting. So for example, the median there, 0.34%, that means the median plan, the one that's right in the middle, had an investment return experience that was 34 basis points, three tenths of 1%, sorry, one third of 1% above their uh, actuarial assumption. Uh, but it does run a wide range. And you can see that uh, there are some plans, uh, some peer groups that are consistently outperforming their assumption and uh, some peer groups that are consistently falling short of their assumption. Um, if your plan is consistently falling short of its assumption, you need to review that assumption. Um, if you are a trustee, you have a fiduciary obligation to reconsider that assumption. Um, this is not healthy to consistently fall short of your assumption, whether it's investment return or rates of retirement or um, mortality, whatever, whatever assumption you've got. If your experience is consistently off, you need to change that assumption. Uh, this is thrown out sort of for what it's worth. This is a um, projected returns individual asset classes over the next 10 years by Horizon Actuarial Services. Horizon, Horizon is an actuarial service consultant primarily to corporate plans and Taft-Hartley or union type plans. Uh, so we, many of you probably uh, have not, may not have heard about them um, but, uh, because they work in a different market, but they consistently put out this, uh, annually put out this um, projection of uh, expected returns. This, uh, these returns are consensus forecasts of a group of 20 or so blue chip investment consultants whose names you would recognize. Um, these are, you know, the JP Morgans and the Callens and, and so forth of the world. Uh, and you can see there's been a clear trend and a steady decline in projected returns. Again, it's not my forecast. I don't know. I'm not an investment expert, but this is where they say that they're going. So based on this, one could infer the using a typical public pension fund, asset allocation, projected returns over the next 10 years for a diversified portfolio using, by, using public pension plans, probably be in the ballpark of maybe six, six and a half percent. They could be wrong, of course, nobody knows. Excuse me. So I wanna move on to contributions contribution experience, public pension plans in the state. We've got 
contribution experience of 89 plans, 89 of the 100. So this is the ADC, the amount the actuary recommended needed to be paid in order to cover the normal cost, the cost of benefits accrued each year, and the cost to amortize or eliminate the unfunded liability over some funding period, typically less than 30 years, ADC. Uh, and the Pension Review Board receives this information. You, uh, public, you, you and public pension plans send this to the uh, Pension Review Board. And so this is experience of these 89 plans. One thing's worth noting right off the bat is you see that 810 plan experience. Most of the 8, 810 plans in the United States, I mean, sorry, in Texas, are paying the full actuarially determined contribution. In other words, they're not really using a fixed uh, employer contribution rate. They're using the uh, uh, actuarially determined contribution rate. So the actuary tells them this is the amount that you need to uh, uh, pay your benefits and uh, eliminate the uh, unfunded liability, and uh, that, that's the amount that they pay. Some plans are uh, consistently receiving more than their full actuarial determined contribution. Some are receiving consistently less. Uh, and you can see there are a fair number of plans in the state that are consistently receiving less. This is a problem. This is a serious problem. Trustees in the state of Texas, pu public pension plan trustees, are required to take minimum educational requirements. And one of those requirements is risk, to understand the role of risk in your pension plan. For many plans, the biggest risk facing your plan is the shortfall in employer contributions. This right here, this is a major risk facing your plan. If your plan is below, let's pick a number, 80%. That is a serious risk to the long-term actuarial soundness of your plan. And if you are a trustee, you ought to be screaming from the highest mountaintop that this is a problem and the plan sponsor, whether it's the city, the state, the county, whoever, needs to be paying the pension plan. It is not okay if you are a trustee to sit idly by while your plan is consistently annually, annually receiving less than the required contribution. It's just not okay. You're not fulfilling the role, of, uh, the role that you have as a fiduciary. You have a fiduciary obligation to operate in the best interest of the plan. And if the employer is consistently skipping the plan, shorting the plan's contributions, that is your job to tell somebody, to go down to the city council and talk to them, to talk to your fellow board members, to talk to your plan members, to do what it takes to get that figure back up to 100%. Because every one of these, fig these bars that's under 100% is kicking the can down the road and somebody's going to be holding the bag. Somebody is going to be holding that bag. Okay, I got a question. Paul? Whoever wants to clap for Paul, <clears throat> it's all right. <clears throat> Thank you, Paul. Appreciate your comments. Uh, as I have said to a number of audiences before, uh, Texas has a public pension governance problem. And when I say a public pension governance problem, that is not a, uh, an attack on trustees. 
It is a reflection on the fact that the statutes and rules under which we all operate are flawed, fundamentally flawed. Uh, for all of its great qualities, the state of Texas has done, excuse me, in my, in my opinion, a lousy job of setting up a public pension structure. Uh, the, the incentives are not well aligned, and uh, there's little incentive in many cases for employers to pay the full required contribution or employees to demand it or trustees to demand it because they have different interests and there's not really anything forcing them to come together to work toward long-term um, fun full funding of the plan. At the same time, there's nothing stopping city councils, other plan sponsors from paying the full required contribution. And there's nothing stopping trustees from asking, demanding that, trust, that uh, city councils and other plan sponsors pay the full required contribution. But I agree the larger problem is statutory and it's rules-based and it needs to be addressed and I'll be talking about that in a few minutes. Uh, one thing I want everybody to take away from this, though, is that this is a problem. This is not okay. This is not normal. It's not healthy. There are some plans, like Illinois that we looked at a moment ago, uh, in states that consistently fail to pay the required contribution. And Illinois uh, has got a long slog, and uh, I think there's a, some chance that somebody in Illinois, some teacher, some state employee, uh, is going to be, be left holding the bag and not able to receive their full benefit someday because of the hole that they, that they have dug. And God forbid that ever happens in the state of Texas. You probably are familiar with the uh, Texas Attorney General's opinion a few years ago in which a state legislator, provoked by a state legislator who asked, is the state liable for um, a local pension plan's obligations? If a local pension plan can't pay its pension obligation, is the state liable? And the Attorney General said no. So the state's not going to provide relief. Uh, each city that sponsors a pension plan is on its own. And God forbid one of these days a firefighter is told, I'm sorry, that pension plan that you've been working toward for years ain't there. And that is a plausible outcome from some of this experience right here. And I should hasten to add, look at the red bars on this. That's the state. That is the state, statewide plans. The two red bars on the right, toward the right-hand side are Texas Municipal Retirement System, County and District Retirement System. Consistently receive 100% or more from each of their hundreds of employers. 810 plans we talked about. These red plans on the lower left-hand side, TRS, um, the state recently has stepped up and improved its funding of TRS to its uh, um, credit. ERS, same thing. We know what happened with ERS. The state is now committed to paying the full uh, uh, actually determined contribution until the uh, unfunded liability is paid. That, lower le that bar on the far lower left-hand side is uh, the law enforcement custodial officers plan that's part of the ERS, and they have consistently underfunded that. Um, for what it's worth, and I'm not making excuses for the state, um, but for what it's worth, the relative size of the problem, uh, the pension funding problem for the, the ERS and the judicial retirement system and the law enforcement system that are administered by the ERS, is a lot smaller than it is for a lot of these cities that are consistently paying, uh, underpaying their uh, contribution. So it looks bad for the state, and it is, but the relative, I mean, the state could fairly easily just step up and uh, eliminate its unfunded pension liabilities if it wanted to. Uh, that's not the case with many of these local, with many of these local plans. So Texas is one of the states in the country, and there are a handful of them, that relies predominantly on a fixed contribution rate for its pension plans. Not all, but many. Fixed contribution rate. And the benefit of that is obvious. You know from a budgeting standpoint what it's going to cost you each year. The problem is, that, though, when the contribution rate does not adjust and the actual experience falls out of line with what's expected, something has to give. And either it's a benefit that has to give or more has to be contributed from employees. Something is going to happen. And unless you have an arrangement for that something else to happen, your funding level is going to drop. And that's really what's happened. And the Pension Review Board conducted a study a couple of years ago uh, focusing on fixed rate pension plans and the, the experience they had. And this chart is plotting the uh, experience of fixed rate plans and uh, actually determined based contribution plans in, in the state uh, during this period, uh, 04 to uh, 18. And you can see that plans that had an actually determined contribution rate um, it had a much more positive experience. They were able to pull out of the, uh, especially the Great Recession, 08 and 09, whereas those plans that rely on a fixed contribution rate have not. 
they have continued to slowly and steadily decline. It shouldn't be a surprise. So you're probably familiar with this charge. It just came out a couple of weeks ago. The House Committee of Record with regard to public pensions in the state was given this charge, review TELFRA to ensure proper governance and financial oversight, examine whether the Pension Review Board has proper oversight and authority to implement necessary corrective measures. And my understanding is Mr. Uh, Representative Anchia spoke about this yesterday. Um, and I will just tell you, as one member of the Pension Review Board, what I would suggest uh, they change with regard to governance. Uh, remember, governance is referring to the statutory, the statutes and the rules that are used. It's not referring to the individual trustees. I believe that trustees are operating in good faith. I believe that trustees are competent. That's not the issue. The issue is the framework that we're all working in. First, in my view, full actuarially determined contribution ought to be required. Many states require that in the United States. There's no reason not to. How many cities, how many counties, special districts, the state itself, are paying less than their full required payment on a bond? Just doesn't happen. Almost none. And for those where it does happen, they are in severe distress. Uh, it's a special circumstance, and they suffer consequences that are rather severe. Why is it okay to consistently pay less than full required contribution? It's kicking the can down the road. It's handing the bag to somebody else, somebody who's not in the room, typically. And it, to me, it's uh, morally wrong. It ought to be legally wrong. I don't know what legal enforcement is, uh, is available. I don't have a suggestion as to what legal enforcement is available. I do know that in a couple of states, Tennessee and Illinois, for two, where the state finds that uh, local government is consistently failing to pay its required contribution, the state intervenes and takes a portion of the revenue that was intended for that city or special district and puts it into the pension plan instead. You know, I'm, I, don't, I don't know what the answer is. I'd hate to see the state resort to that, but I would like to see some required actuarially determined contribution statute put into place rather than kicking the can down the road, which a number of uh, cities and other plan sponsors in the state are doing. Uh, as the slide indicates, paying the ADC is a, considered a public pension best practice. Contribution rates should not be negotiable. That's the amount, that's the cost of the plan. Why are we negotiating how much we're going to contribute toward the cost of the plan? It is what it is. We've got to pay for it. Secondly, require joint city council and board approval of employee contribution rates and benefit changes. It just ought to happen that way. The city is liable for the benefits and their costs. The city council represents the taxpayers, those who rely on public services. The city council ought to be participating in these really major decisions that affect the long-term costs, the long-term financial viability of the city. And also, voting on one's own contribution rates and benefit levels, to me, is just a, it's a clear conflict of interest. And it's not suggesting anybody is not operating in good faith. It's just a conflict of interest. And I could be missing something, but I'm not aware of any other pension plan in the United States where employees are allowed to vote, to elect, to determine, to set their own benefit levels and contribution rates for obvious reasons. And so if Representative Anchia and the board ask me um, for my thoughts as one member of the Pension Review Board, and I don't speak for the Pension Review Board, but they, if they ask for my thoughts, these are the uh, two suggestions I'm going to make to them in terms of their, uh, their interim charge. Yes, sir. You're saying you have to have both. I see, right. So the gentleman here, in case you didn't hear, says he's from Florida, and Florida has both of these requirements, and in his view, they have to go together. You have to have the full required contribution, and you have to have city council and board participation in the uh, determination of those, of those decisions. Thank you. Um, so 
I am truly happy to talk about public pension issues with anybody uh, at almost any time. This is my contact information. Feel free to email me, to call me. Um, and uh, with that, that's the end of my prepared remarks, and I'd be happy to take any other um, questions. Yes, sir. That's a lot to remember. <laughs> um, you know, the first thing that comes to mind when you ask your question is that in the wake of these very strong investment returns that we, that we have seen, um, there have been a couple of uh, big statewide plans outside the state of Texas that have announced that they're reducing their return assumption, uh, t essentially taking risk off the table, reducing their level of risk because they've uh, made these returns that, is, uh, that have improved their funding level, is lowering their costs, and they were able to reduce their return assumption without having uh, um, any or a significant effect on the cost or the funding level of the plan. Uh, and so that's sort of anecdotal evidence that at least some people are, are taking advantage of the strong investment gains to uh, lower their level of risk. Um, just my observation is that most public pension plans are not really in the habit of thinking of their asset allocation in, in such a long term as you just described like that. It's a level of risk relative to their funding level, their cash flow needs, and so on. And it's something I think that generally ought to happen a little bit more often. Um, and particularly in the wake of the strong investment gains, I think it's an opportunity for every public pension plan, if they did experience these uh, strong investment gains, to reconsider their level of risk. Um, we are seeing some plans that are uh, likely to move toward full funding, and uh, I don't know what they're thinking, but it would be nice if some of them would uh, consider their overall level of, uh, of risk. These plans, you know, 30 years ago, plans were much less mature. We had many more active plan participants, fewer annuitants on a relative basis. Plans, it's akin to an individual who is younger in their life, age 30, 35 as opposed to 50 or 55. You can take more risk generally when you're younger. You have more time to uh, um, work out the market volatility and so on, and public pension plans are akin to that. Um, and we're much more mature now, and there are far fewer active contributing participants in public pension plans today than there were 30 years ago. Fewer people coming out of college. You know, I've looked at uh, annual financial reports from public pension plans 40 years ago in the 80s, and there were five, six, seven active uh, members for every annuitant, and now it's approaching one-to-one -one in, in a lot of cases. Uh, and for those reasons and others, I think the public pension plans ought to take a holistic long-term view of their cash flow obligations, uh, their risk profile, asset allocation, and so on. Does that address both questions? It does. Thank you, Keith. Thank you. Other questions? Over here. Yes, sir.
So the, the, so the question goes back to that slide that was comparing the average returns of uh, different peer groups among plans uh, compared to their actuarial assumption. Well, you might remember that uh, the average actuarial assumption for the 810 plans was about, uh, I think, 6.6%, significantly below those others. Um, and I think that uh, has to be a major factor in that, that their, uh, their basis, their starting point was much lower. Yes, sir? The 810 and the Telfer plans. Um, <clears throat> yep. What explains the difference between the returns of, say, the 810 plans? Can you throw the statewide plans in there as well? They had a higher average return than the than the. I I see. Um, I I haven't examined the attribution of the 810 plans uh, returns. I don't know why they're experiencing that level of returns. I don't know what their asset allocation or risk uh, level of risk has been. Um, I do know that uh, as a group, Telfra plans uh, pay more in fees. Uh, they have higher expenses than uh, others, and uh, their returns tend to be a little bit lower uh, as a group. Um, there may be uh, any number of reasons uh, that is uh, applicable to all or certain plans among those Telfra plans. Um, in addition to those fees, I think that smaller plans, and this isn't just in the state of Texas, but it goes nationwide, um, have less access to certain markets. When the big private equity providers come calling, they're not calling on the uh, $80 million plans, they're calling on the $5 billion and $10 billion plans for those, uh, for those opportunities. It may be unfair, but it is what it is. Um, and it's not my, part of my presentation, and I'm not trying to open a Pandora's box here, but personally I think that if one is interested in maximizing or optimizing investment return, all of these small funds ought to pool themselves and operate as a single fund rather than uh, all these individual ones. They'd lower their administrative costs, they'd lower their investment costs, and I think they would uh, realize higher returns. Yes, sir. Oh, the Kentucky Retirement System. Yeah. Um, the, the Kentucky Retirement System is, and again, it's a governance issue. I'm not uh, questioning any individual in the state of Kentucky. Uh, but the, the way they set up their pension plan, they had an open amortization period. I think it was 30-year amortization, which meant that they were not making any progress, meaningful progress, on paying down their unfunded liability. Even though they were paying what the actuary told them to pay in terms of the, or they weren't even doing that. They were, that was another issue, was they were paying significantly less than the ADC. But even if they had paid the full ADC, they were not making progress on paying down their unfunded liability. So it was a, combi a combination of actuarial methods and assumptions, the fiscal approach of making the uh, less than their full required contribution. They had a, one or two early retirement incentives that were very generous to uh, uh, folks who elected to retire during that time frame. Uh, those are three of the, uh, of the reasons. It's really, it really comes together as a story of, of exactly how not to uh, manage a, uh, a public pension plan, quite honestly. Other questions? Yes, sir, in the back. Well, if you, uh, everybody here has questioned that if the, the uh, source of uh, um, 
revenue for public pension funds has consistently been in the 60, 60 to 65 percent uh, range, then, then th that suggests that public pension plans are, are doing something right and uh, making adjustments as necessary. Um, and my response would be that all, you're, you're looking at only one uh, slice of the public pension um, funding equation there. Something else that has gone on during that same time frame is that unfunded liabilities for that same group of people have risen significantly. Significantly. Uh, huge unfunded liabilities, not, not universal or evenly spread, but significantly greater unfunded liabilities among public pension plans. In addition, employers now, as a group in the United States, are contributing three, four, maybe five times uh, in just in dollar terms of what they were contributing at the beginning of that, of that measurement period. Uh, and so you, you, I, I think that it would not be fair to look only at the consistency of one major source of revenue without taking into effect the other changes that have occurred during the same time frame. And I appreciate the question. I have a little clock down here that says uh, 10 seconds and 10, 9, 8. I am happy to take uh, one more question. Otherwise, that's the end of my prepared remarks. My contact information is there, and uh, it's an honor to be with you. Uh, thanks very much.